Only one year in aviation, and already it's changed my life in so many ways. From seeing the world from a whole new perspective to traveling all over the country, it has been absolutely one roller coaster of a ride. The people and the friends I've made, the challenges, and all the time spent training and studying and preparation for getting my license, the hardships, the frustrations, the challenges. It seems like it all went by so quick, but every single moment was so worthwhile and so worth it in the end. In this video, I want to tell you my personal experience in passing my private pilot check ride and getting my private pilot's license to being the first step in my aviation career. I hope this helps you on your journey, and if just for curiosity, I hope it helps you as well. Hey, welcome to Ameliorate Aviation. If you're new here, thank you so much for joining us on this video. I want to tell you my personal experience and taking my private pilot check ride. There's going to be three main parts of this video. The first part is going to cover my overall experience. The second part I'm going to cover is the ground portion. The third part it's going to be the flight portion. So let's dive right in. My overall experience was actually pretty positive. My check ride took about five hours. Uh, the examiner I was doing it with really loved the ground portion, so we went really in depth on that. The flying part took about another two hours, two and a half hours. About a 10, 15 minute break in the middle. I was really nervous. I think everybody I've seen and talked to are always nervous on their check rides. And I, you know, I've even talked to CFIs and commercial pilots who've taken quite a few check rides. And uh, even for them, it's still pretty nerve wracking. So being nervous isn't anything unnatural. It's pretty normal, um, even if you're experienced or inexperienced. Uh, you're, you're always going to be somewhat a little bit anxious, a little bit nervous. You've been training and studying for a long time, so now it's just time to prove that you uh, know the information you do and the skills that you have. The guy who examines you, he's called a designated pilot examiner. First of all, he's going to probably try to break the ice with you and get you to a place where you're more comfortable. So he might ask you some questions to get you to know you a little bit. That's what I did is I found out uh, Jay, I won't say his last name, but he was my DP and he was really, really positive and great guy. He asked me where I'm from, got to know me. Uh, he's about six foot, like typical aviator type of guy. Short hair, spiky hair, really friendly, really charismatic, outgoing, really encouraging as well. But definitely probably one of the harder examiners at our flight school. We have, I think like three or four that serve our flight school uh, or our college in particular. And <laughs> we yes, we do know which ones are good and which ones are are uh, not so good. The first 30 minutes of the track ride was basically filling out paperwork, getting everything in order, showing him my credentials. Um, in fact, I'll go through a whole list of everything that he asked me to prepare for and bring to the check ride. And uh, it's a pretty long list, so get your pen and notepad ready and write some of these things down. All right, so how to set up an appointment. So you're gonna probably get a phone number from your uh, FBO or your flight instructor who's going to give you a phone number of a, of a DP. You're going to go ahead and give him a call, that's what I did, and he's going to ask for your phone number, he's going to ask for your full name, he's going to ask for your certification number, uh, your IACRA info, um, your phone number, then he's going to ask for your flight instructor's number, his certification number, so make sure you have those things, and his FTN number as well as your own FTN number, part of the certification there. The next part that he wanted me to do in setting up the check ride, plan a cross-country flight. And the flight that I was uh, asked to prepare was from Walla Walla, Kilo Alpha Lima Whiskey, to Scapoos, which is Kilo Sierra Papa Bravo. He wanted me to do it at a departure of 2100 Zulu. He wanted me to get the weather forecast. He wanted me to get the weight and balance uh, and gave him and he gave me his weight plus a five pound bag and asked me to put that in calculations as well uh, He asked me to bring uh, the make sure the aircraft logbook was ready and in order 
and the inspection. He wanted me to be familiar with the ACS. If you're not familiar with the ACS, well, I hope you are, <laughs> but if you're not, it's this white and blue book right here. And uh, what's cool about this is it pretty much has the entire check ride uh, laid out in order for you and has all the categories and subcategories uh, laid out very clearly in here for you guys. So I highly encourage uh, you to look over that many times. Um, I started looking over it towards the end because I finally got, oh, that's what the check ride's going to be. And it really helped me and uh, helped me be aware of what to prepare for. I ended up going back through and I took about a good day and a half and just went through and, and uh, filled out all these pages and took notes um, as I went back to review all the subjects and categories that we had gone over. He wanted me to bring my logbook and have all the totals added up. And I did it on a piece of paper and then I put it in my logbook. And then for the solo cross country of 250 nautical miles, what I ended up doing was highlighting that in yellow and then putting a sticky note over that so he could easily find that. And that just helps him out. And they say that if you make your DPE's life better and easier, having all your times, everything in order, everything ready to go, he's gonna make your life easier. And I, I think that in some ways that's true. Um, if anything, just makes the process a lot more streamlined and a lot more efficient and quick. So if that's something you're looking for, uh, that's always a plus. All right, student pilot credential. So he wanted me to have, hold on, my student private pilot certificate, which is this thing right here. So he wanted me to have this with my stuff. And then from there, he wanted me to show my medical license. And I got a first class medical. Um, it's valid for 12 months because I'm below the age of 40. And then after the first year, uh, it becomes invalid as a first class medical. And then it becomes a uh, third class medical for the next five years. So I'm pretty much set. Uh, until I'm ready to join the airlines, in which case when I apply to become an ATP for my ATP license, then I will go ahead and get a first class medical. Uh, there's like three different classes and then there's basic med, which came around about 2016. All right, and he also wanted me to bring my written test results and that's kind of important. There's a big reason why uh, you want to do well on your written test and when you take your check ride, your, the DPE is going to ask you on the questions that you missed on the check ride or on the written test. So if you miss a lot of things on airspace, he's gonna be pretty, he's gonna go pretty in depth on airspace. If there's a lot of weather, he's gonna go really in depth in weather. If it's atmospheric conditions, like 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, you know, all those kind of things, he's gonna ask you probably more questions about the composition of weather, which is actually some of the questions he asked me. Well, the first thing he, he wanted me to do was prove that the aircraft is airworthy. And what I had was the aircraft logbook, uh, the maintenance logbook, so I went through and I showed him exactly when it was completed, each one of the items, and for that you use your acronym AVIATE. And so the annual, I showed him where that was due. Uh, your VORs, they get checked every 30 days, but you actually don't have to have them uh, checked in order to fly VFR, which is pretty cool. But if you're flying uh, instrument or, you know, even if you're flying at night, but if you're flying instrument, then you have to check them every 30 days, but it's not required for VFR flying. The next thing that you will want to do is uh, yeah, go through your whole acronym, make sure everything's airworthy, and then the fun questions start beginning. So after I've proven that the aircraft is airworthy, he asked me uh, what are the different categories, the class um, and type of aircraft. Right, and then you have uh, single engine land, multi engine land, single engine C, uh, multi engine C, and so forth. Um, he asked me all those kind of questions, and then we moved into pilot privileges and limitations and that was a pretty lengthy part of the exam so privileges and limitations there's a certain part in the far aim and actually let me get that for you what i do you can see this right here is i put a bunch of sticky notes and i highlighted and i bookmarked all the different um, places of importance and uh, it's kind of a nice little cheat little hack you can do because on your check right you can actually bring this book and if you don't know an answer to something, sometimes they will let you look it up for uh, non-important things. Like eight tomato flames, they're gonna want you to have that memorized. Um, but if it comes to like privileges of a private pilot, what can you do, what can you not do? Um, he'll ask you, he asked me a bunch of questions about that. And so there's a pretty lengthy list of things you can do as a private pilot and things you can't do on part 61, 113 of the far end. And uh, something that he did ask me was, can you bring a box with you if it's for a business and deliver that uh, without going through the postal service. Does that count for compensation or higher? 
and the term that is used for that is is it incidental to the flight so if you have a business that you're flying to if it's not incidental to the flight and then you're gonna uh, deliver the package to that business you can do that legally without it falling under under the category of compensation or higher uh, paid for more than the, the prorated share of a flight. So if I take one other passenger and myself, uh, we split the cost 50-50. Let's say that he pays me 60% or 70% of the flight. That goes under the lines of compensation or higher, and then it's not legal. Uh, basic stuff. So next thing he asks, can a private pilot lead out and search rescue operations if you're a friend of somebody? Yes, you can if you're given authority to do so from ATC. And then he asked me, can a private pilot demonstrate in aircraft's uh, capabilities? And the answer is yes, you can if you have 200 hours. Privileges of a private pilot on part 61, 113. Uh, read through that list because it's got a lot of good stuff in there. The next thing he asked me is what kind of preventative maintenance can you do? And for that, a uh, simple answer is uh, there's a comprehensive list on part 43 on Appendix A, and it goes through an entire list of things you can do as a private pilot. Farium's got a lot of good stuff in it. I would highly recommend that you go through, bookmark, highlight uh, the important areas, and I'll tell you exactly which ones I did. So if you want to do those, you're welcome to do that as well. Okay, so after he asked me a bunch of questions about is the aircraft airworthy, private pilot uh, privileges and limitations. What are those? Um, the next thing he asked me, an operative equipment. Um, okay, and that's another one I wanted to briefly go over. This is something I didn't understand is when does Aviate and an MEL, how do they differ? And then along with that service bulletins, type, type data certificates and uh, ADs, where do all those fall into place? Best way I learned it uh, later, I wish I'd have learned it this way the first time, where it actually like, clicked and made sense, is that the MEL, actually let me just go ahead and put it up on the screen here for you guys. So you have a one-stop document, which is your MEL. The only way that you can get an MEL, which is a minimal equipment list, is apply for it through the FISDO or through the Flight Service District's office. And it has to be approved to be able to be valid. If you do not have an MEL, then you're gonna go and use the A Tomato Flames acronym, 91213D2. And that's going to have a tomato flames and 91205. And then you ask the question, is it required by ADs? If it's inoperative, then you must place placards and deactivate or pull a circuit breaker. So if it's your pitot heat, you've got to deactivate that and pull a circuit breaker for that. The next question that you ask is if it meets the a tomato flames in the flaps category and it meets the AD category, the next thing you're going to go down to is does it conform to the type data certificate? And type data certificate is going to have a list of different uh, propellers or parts that you can put on your airplane that's designed for it and if it doesn't fall into that category then you can't do that and does it have an aircraft's equipment list the next thing we went into is the weather and that was probably the most in-depth subject that we went over it took the most amount of time so he asked me to identify symbols that would show up in a weather brief or in prog charts uh, he had me interpret uh, surface analysis charts, uh, talk about air mets, the three different types, the Tango, Zulu, Sierra. Um, he t had me talk about uh, sigmets as well, non-convective and convective. He had me interpret METARs, TAFs, when do those come out, when are those, and how long are they valid for? And METARs come out every hour, and TAFs come out four times a day. For sigmets as well, he asked me how long are they valid for? So weather took a long time. We talked about microbursts, and it was like 6,000 feet Per minute that you could either drop in a sudden microburst, uh, which is incredibly fast and scary. What other things did we talk about in weather? He had me do a standard weather brief, so he had me go through and just demonstrate that I knew how to pull up a weather briefing on four flight. Go through that. He asked me questions about it. He asked me sim uh, he asked me about the different symbols, what they mean. He asked me about elongated troughs, and he asked me about ridges, what those mean. What I did is I had a chart of different symbols. One of them was like the thunderstorm symbol. I learned what that one was. What else did we, oh yeah, he had me do the one for smoke. I forget what it is now. I think it was like a swiggly line or something like that. And that one's pretty uh, common during the summer times here in the Northwest. We get a lot of wildfires, so we get a lot of uh, the smoke in the air during the summer months. Uh, okay, moving on from weather, because there's a lot there, um, which I'll do future videos about. 
uh, he wanted me to talk about the operation systems. He had me talk about the engine, the Lycoming e, uh, 320E2D, uh, horizontally opposed cylinders, and 150 horsepower uh, engine. As this, we have a Cessna 172 Model M, and so a couple different features of the airplanes there. Um, I went through and I wrote down all the different systems. I even wrote down the rigidity in space, uh, how many RPM that the heading indicator and the attitude indicator are running at. So it's like 10,000 to 15,000 RPM. Uh, that's where you get that rigidity in space. He also asked me about compass errors, the ANS and UNOS, accelerate north, decelerate south, undershoot north, uh, overshoot south, different things like that. Okay, so operation systems. He also asked me what the voltage is, uh, how many amps, um, how long can the battery operate, and you know, at a certain amount of volts. And I believe that the alternators, they charge the battery. The battery uses about 12 volts per hour, and I think, or something like that, I'm probably saying it wrong, it's been a while. So it charges the battery uh, because it's, it generates more power than the airplane systems consume. He also asked me about different types of airframes, I think. He asked me a lot about uh, airspace as well. He asked me a great deal about the visibility requirements that are involved in each airspace. Good stuff to know is how do they relate with each other. We're getting to the end here, guys. Human factors, hypoxia, um, and then what are the legalities of uh, drugs and alcohol? And so he asked me several questions like, if you took DayQuil, would, could you go fly? And I said, uh, well, it would probably make me drowsy and not capable of manipulating the controls or understanding uh, the right thing to do because I'm fatigued. Um, it's a, a drug that causes fatigue. And so I said, I, I probably would not fly. I could not fly. And he was like, good answer. Um, alcohol, I don't drink personally, but if you do, I think it's 0.04% is what you're allowed. You're not supposed to drink within eight hours of your flight. Uh, it is... What's up? Does she want me to be quiet? No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> What's she asking? Can I borrow your iPad? Borrow my iPad? I feel like it's a no. For what? Just FaceTime me. Oh, you want to borrow my iPad? I'm almost done with it. Yeah, you can. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. I like walking on him, he's like filming a video, yeah, holding fine. his sacred iPad. Okay. Yeah, I got all the good like info in here. Like, no. <laughs> no, it's okay, I'm almost done. Another thing that I marked in, in the forum was the oxygen requirements. And um, whew, you can see that there's a lot here, a lot of good stuff marked. And what I did for that is, yeah, supplemental oxygen. So when is that required? 12,500 feet, if you're at that altitude or above for a period of over 30 minutes or more, you are required to use oxygen. If you're at cabin pressure altitudes above 14,000, then you're required to have oxygen at, on at all times and for all of passengers. 15,000 is when every single person on the plane is required to have oxygen. Okay, we're coming to the end of the uh, oral part of the exam. Again, I'm kind of skipping through this pretty quickly. There was a lot to uh, this portion. Um, and really, I just kind of highlighted the main points and themes uh, through the oral part and try to give you as many examples or uh, questions as I couldn't remember. Um, but there are a lot of questions, obviously. Going on to the flight portion. Now, this is the fun part. We took a, about a 15 minute break, got water, went to the bathroom, and then we headed out to the plane. I went and pre flighted the airplane. He watched me do it, make sure I was uh, doing all the procedures. I had my checklist in my hand. It's kind of a nice thing that they like to see. So I'm not missing anything. I'm looking under for castellated nuts, making sure that all the wires are attached properly. Then I go ahead and walk on the outside of the plane, check the fuel, sump the fuel, uh, make sure everything's full. And uh, yeah, pretty much good to go after that. I'm gonna jump in the plane, check everything. Just make sure the aircraft is airworthy. He wants to see those three documents in the plane. The registration, state and federal. And then he wants to see and make sure that their airworthiness certificate is in the aircraft. Very, very important. Then he wanted to make sure the operating handbook was in the plane, which it was. We jump in the plane. I go ahead and start the aircraft, check all the instruments. We go ahead and get the weather and then we taxi. I go ahead and do the run up to call up ground. We taxi, I brief the taxiway, do my departure briefing. Uh, he has me do a normal takeoff. I intercept my radial. So the first part of the flight is just pretending like you're going on this cross country flight. So you're just gonna intercept your radio, and he wants me to get to my first point within five minutes of what I forecasted my first point would be. So that was the first portion of the flight. Once I reached that first point, he had me do a diversion to Pullman. Uh, the thing that I forgot to do, that I was flying west, 
but when I was diverting to Pullman, now I'm flying east, so I needed to change my altitude. So I was at 4,500. I needed to descend now down to 3,500. So I forgot to do that, and he brought that up at the end of the check ride. Um, he had me put on my instrument simulated goggles, and uh, I forgot my goggles for the check ride. Very, very bad thing to do. <laughs> I'm, oh man, I remember being really stressed out about that. But I found a black pair of instrument goggles that are really uh, concealing, and so you can't very see very much. Um, and it was my first time wearing those, and I could, like, it totally threw me off because it, it restricts your vision, vision so much more than goggles or those other plastic ones that go over your eyes do. I felt like it was the first time I've actually been in IFR because I couldn't see anything else. I had any light purely inside the cockpit, and uh, that definitely is, is a different world and experience for sure. He had me recover from unusual attitude, so he had me close my eyes, put my head down, and then recover. And then uh, I think we got into maneuvers from then on. So he had me doing clearing turns. I, well, I did my clearing turns. He didn't say anything. Uh, that's also a fail item. If you don't do your clearing turns on a check ride, that's an automatic fail. So make sure you do those. Uh, don't learn it the hard way. So I did my clearing turns. I did steep turns. And then I went into my stalls. Power on, power off stall. Uh, from there, I did an emergency simulation. And that was just an engine failure. The next one I did was and electrical fire and so did two simulated emergencies went through the checklist for those then we're down at a lower altitude we did turns around a point then I did s turns and um, he had me fly back to the airport and we did touch and goes in the pattern and that proceeded the next I think, 30 minutes or so and I think I did four takeoffs and landings total that day so pretty big day um, very exhausting, and the thing about the landings and takeoffs, you had short field and uh, soft field takeoffs and landings, and then he had me do a slip to land uh, maneuver on one of them as well. Um, just a normal landing for the last one, and that was the end of the check ride. Hey guys, Benji here. If you're wondering why my shirt's changed, it's uh, currently another day, and I found out as I was editing the video that my camera died part way through. Uh, anyways, I just wanted to wrap up the video real quick say th special thank you to all of you who have been with me from the start of this channel I really appreciate your continued support. I really love your feedback as well and hearing about uh, all of your guys' uh, adventures and Your successes. Congratulations to all of you who passed your private pilot written exam That's a huge step forward and I think by now many of you are already working towards your private pilot's license I already got your private pilot's license so congratulations, uh, wishing you all the best. Um, hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and that you guys will come back for some more and awesome videos. Thank you so much. If you guys like this video, please give it a like, subscribe down below if you haven't, come be a part of my channel and can't wait to see you next video. Take care.